Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I'm here with my good buddy, Tony Lopes, and he is going to tell us how we can survive and thrive in the 2020s and hopefully through a fourth turning. So kind of a common guy's guide to just surviving for what we're going to most likely deal with, uh, some turbulent times in the near future. So, Tony, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist channel, buddy. Ah, thank you, George. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, now you just came out with a book that kind of goes over this. So why don't you go over kind of the premise for your book? And you're a good buddy, so I wanted uh, to have you on to promote it. And then let's go into the market recap for the day because uh, we got Josh on the line. And I'm only going to have time to do one video today because uh, we're at our mastermind group. You're, you're a member of my mastermind and we've got a lot of other stuff to do. So we'll go into our market recap and then into a deep dive in your book and give some people some actionable advice as to how they can uh, not only survive, but thrive. So, but before we get to the market cap, can you go over kind of a short uh, reader's digest version of your book? Sure, sure. So my book is, you know, kind of based on my experience after speaking with folks who, you know, they, uh, so I should take a step back. The title of my book is called Freedom at Risk, How mm -hmm. to Protect Your Personal and Financial Freedoms. Great. And it was based on my conversations with a lot of people out there, just everyday people trying to figure it out like you and me, right? Yeah. Just trying to figure out our freedoms. And what I discovered was, a lot of folks were treating their freedoms kind of like a casino, right? Mm -hmm. They would treat their uh, their freedoms like pulling the arm on a slot machine right. and whatever freedom showed up on the screen, they would just accept, right? And so through my book, what I try to show folks is how to treat their freedoms more like a game of blackjack, right? Mm -hmm. Probabilities, predictabilities, right? And be more strategic in terms of finding your freedoms in this world. Yeah, okay, got it. So that's a great teaser. And I, I want to get into three or four actionable kind of bullet points. So we can do it three simple, fast steps. If you want. <laughs> sure, let's do it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, let's get over into the market here. because I, I do want to recap the day. I know the NASDAQ was up and the stock market was up and the, the what was it, Luna or whatever that... Uh, quote unquote, stable, ironically enough, coin, uh, I guess went BK. And so that's going to potentially affect Tether, which might affect Bitcoin. Let's get into the markets real quick here. The, the CNBC homepage will start by looking at the U.S. market. So Dow up 466 points today, S&P up 93, NASDAQ up 434 and like I said, big story of the day here, regulators are growing anxious. And, well, and when regulators grow anxious, that makes rebel capitalists anxious because we know there's going to be some, uh, you know, the, the politicians never have to pay for their mistakes, but uh, people in the private sector like you and I do. And so do entrepreneurs. And uh, as the, you know, Tara should, but what ends up happening is we get a lot of unintended consequences from these regulations to, quote unquote, protect the average Joe and Jane. And usually what we get is the opposite of that. So I guess it was UST um, falls further from the dollar peg as the cryptocurrency Luna crashes to zero, basically goes bust. And uh, the world's biggest stable coin regains, I guess. It, OK, so it looks like uh, UST has See, what do we hear? World's biggest stable coin regains dollar peg after three billion in withdrawals. Okay, so I'm going to get into that maybe in a later video, Tony. I don't want to take up too much of your time because that's something that I think deserves a deep dive in itself. They're referring to Tether, uh, but we're referring to Terra as far as the collapse. So uh, stock market's up, but I want to point out that the 10 year is at uh, 2.92. And I was just talking to Josh. He said that the two-year is about 2.5 and some change. So we deal, we do st still have kind of a little bit of a steepener there on the curve. Uh, definitely not inverted. But the 10-year was over three just as a few days ago. And now down to, this is telling me that the market is predicting potentially 
that the Fed is going to hike rates at a slower pace. I would be very interested to see what was happening with the euro dollar future curve. And Josh will probably have time to get into that on Monday. Uh, so moving on to oil, uh, that's up to 110. So the supply demand equation isn't getting any better there. Uh, I guess this has a lot to do with what's going on in Russia, Ukraine. I know a lot of the, I think it's the uh, EU or maybe Germany, a few of those countries were talking about shutting off their oil altogether, which as we know, would be not really disastrous for Russia, uh, but would be disastrous for the citizens of those countries that were basically virtue signaling at a sovereign level. Uh, gold. Now, this is something, Tony, and I'd like to get your opinion, because I think you're probably going to be talking a little bit about precious metals uh, when we got, dive into your book. But gold down, I believe it got under 1800 today. And uh, as someone that is really excited about building a long-term position in gold, uh, this is great uh, for me. So again, I'm long-term, I'm bullish, you know, commodity super cycle. So whenever I can get something that I like long-term that takes a big crash, uh, I'm all about it. What are your thoughts on gold at 1800? Yeah. So this is one of the things, like you mentioned, that I talk about in my book where, you know, there's many different ways where you can create multiple income streams and create wealth for your for yourself right? right and i go into the book i talk about real estate and i talk about a lot of different things but one of the things people can do for themselves you don't if you don't have a lot of wealth today to invest in real estate or go buy stocks or bonds or something like that one of the things i share with people is we have a thriving gig economy and the average person can go work in the gig economy make an extra thousand dollars a month in that gig economy and then use that to go buy an asset like gold right mm -hmm. and put that gold into your portfolio right and watch it like you do george and i do right watch it to to find where where those price points are where you want to jump into the gold market right yeah and i'm not saying 1800 that mark but it's uh 1800 for me is a lot better than 1900 or or 2000 it, it's definitely getting cheaper and uh i like to do that 10 80 10 portfolio yep. so the 10 percent of the portfolio that's gold I, I usually buy pretty much at any price if i have excess cash uh, but the, the cheaper i can buy it the better if i want to go long term kind of express my bullish position on gold or my bullish view on gold i would look at some of the gold miners maybe some of the junior miners which I don't have a chart in front of me, but I would assume are are getting are, have just been crushed over the last uh, eh, call it six months or something like that. And for me, as a long term bull, that's that's great news. Uh, most people would have the opposite view. Yeah, exactly. And I, again, we talk about buying gold at, at you know whether it's seventeen hundred or eighteen hundred. For some folks, that may seem like a lot of money, but you bring up a great point in terms of you don't have to buy the actual precious metal. You can go buy gold mo uh, gold miners, right? You know, at a at a you know two shares, five shares, ten ten shares, right? These are the actionable type things that we kind of teach folks to get into the market, start understanding some of these different dynamics that go on, and try to create wealth for yourself when the market conditions are right. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on. And I love the idea about the gig economy. And that's something I did prior to YouTube. A, a few people know that story where I, I went out, and I, I, I proved to a lot of people, including myself, uh, that you could accumulate wealth while working at McDonald's and, and working a gig job. Uh, that was something I did back in I think 2017, maybe it was. And I, I won't go into that because I want to make this about the markets in the book. But for those on the live stream right now that know what I'm talking about, that's kind of like a an inside rebel capitalist George Gammon story for those who watch every single video. <laughs> OK, now let's go over Nasdaq up huge today. So uh, we'd assume Bitcoin is the same. It is uh, up five percent, but it's still hovering and it spent quite a bit of time under 30 which I believe from a technical standpoint is very bearish. And uh, again, as someone who's a long-term bull for with Bitcoin, just for a portion of the 
asset on the speculative side to have some purchasing power outside the banking system. I love it. I love it. I hope it goes down to 20. I hope it goes down to 15 uh, even further so I can add to my position. And what I'm looking for here is just panic in the market. And uh, my, my big trigger would be if Michael Saylor has to sell. If he has to start selling Bitcoin, that's when I start buying. <laughs> that's what I've said multiple times on this channel. So uh, that's what's happening in the market. And I think the big news, big takeaway here is market up on what I think are probably expectations that the Fed is going to maybe continue to raise rates, but raise rates at a slower pace, regardless of you know what they're saying, that we always have to look at what they're doing and not what they're saying. Okay, so we get back, Tony, and go. let's go into some of the actionable advice, just because I get that so often in the comments of my videos. And they sit and say, George, you talk about Klaus, and you talk about Machiavelli and these crazy politicians and Trudeau, and you talk about the repo market and the repo fails and quantitative easing and inversion of the yield curve, potentially bringing down asset prices and home prices coming down. Maybe not in nominal terms, but in real terms, back to their trend line in 2012 to uh, 1997, et cetera. And so, you know, what do I do? And then you all, that other people say, we always talk about a plan B as well, but I can't just pack up and go to uh, Turkey to get my uh, Turkish passport. And, you know, I got my kids in school and I, I, there, there's logistics there, George. <laughs> Not yeah. all of us are single and retired, you know. <laughs> so what can the average Joe do? Yeah, so uh, so uh, you bring up a great point. And for those that are in a position, whether they're single or even if they're married, right, to be able to pull the trigger on something like a dual citizenship is is a huge way to tap into greater freedoms, right? Yeah. Um, what I'm. If very what if they can't do that? Like... What, what if that's just absolutely not an option for them? So to have that same t or the, a similar type of freedom, what is, is there something they can do? I mean, I always talk about just having a, a good like 1990s diesel truck and an RV in your driveway. So like, I mean, that sounded funny, but we go back to 2020 when we had all those, the riots and the looting and whatnot. And uh, that was something that came in very, very handy for a lot of people in these urban areas that could just pack their family up, go up to the mountains and just relax a little bit. You know, another thing, too, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, as you know, my sister lives here in Dallas. And the very first thing I did is I said, Lise, just uh, you know, make sure you've got an exit strategy for the United States. The probability that you have to use it is incredibly low. But the stakes right now are very, very high. Uh, so there is no downside in preparation. So I said, go to a map and figure out if you had to go to Mexico, where would you want to go? And how would you get there in a yeah. moment's notice and make sure you got some extra food in the car and you know some lights and things that you need? There, sure. There's no downside to that type of preparation. But what it, are your it, thoughts? It, no, you're, you're absolutely right, right? And all of this you know, takes a certain amount of uh, planning and thinking yeah. out this strategy, right? You know, you can't think about it one day and expect it to be in place the next day. You know, you have to take action. You have to think this through. One of the things I've been working through with, with a friend of mine is, um, you know, they are looking at buying real estate, right? They're in a very fortunate position. They can purchase some real estate to be able to produce some, you know, some cash flow for them, right. which is great. Um, but we all know this market is at a uh, uh, potentially a top where things are very expensive right now and it's difficult to produce get cash flow. So one of the things I've shared with them that's a very doable is buying a location that's a good location, a safe location, not necessarily a bug out location, but a, a secondary location where you could Airbnb that mm -hmm. property, right? Provide some cash flow, pay the mortgage pay the property tax, right? Pay all the expenses on the property. But then also, if you needed to use it as a secondary location to go to, right? Say, yeah. for example, I mean, let's go to the extreme and say there's a civil war in this country, right? Or there's something that goes on in your state, you know, due to, you know, uh, you know, something happening in society, right? Uh, and you want to bug out of that state, you have another place to go to that you've already thought through, you've already planned for. And to your point, maybe you have some extra food, some extra water on site in that property, 
right? So it's one of those things that it takes time to plan. But if you take that time, you can do it right. And, uh, you know, really protect your freedoms. Yeah, I was looking at properties up in Pine Top in uh, Arizona, just because I thought, you know, what area would I like to spend time if things got a little crazy? And uh, Pine Top was one of those areas, Snowflake as well. But on that note, we've got Josh here. Josh, hop onto the live stream, my friend. Hello. And you are in Dallas as well. And uh, Josh has been with me since last weekend. We were here for the Mark Moss event. And I was speaking there with my buddy, Mark Moss. And uh, I stayed with my sister over the week. So I needed to put up Josh in a hotel. And we act, and my sister lives in Keller, by the way, Keller, Texas. And so we actually put Josh up at a property that I have been talking about on my channel since the very beginning. And this was an old 1973 Airstream that someone purchased and they put on this property that was not too far off the road. And uh, it, what was really neat, I thought it was just that they did it with just one Airstream, but they had an Airstream. They had three container homes on this property and then they had another it was like a it was like a shed like someone turned like their shed into a another airbnb yeah yeah but let's focus on that airstream for a moment because i know a lot of people they they kind of like what george what are you talking about okay let's just do some math here everyone can understand basic math this airstream i i know and it wasn't an airstream it was like a a a, a it was a, uh, a competitor to the Airstream, but it kind of looked like it. It had that vibe, you know, that old school, like American uh, Americana heritage type uh, iconic vibe. It was silver, you know, and they had it all done up to where they had like a swing on the outside and like horseshoes or that cornhole game. And they had these uh, flowers in pots that looked like uh, those things where cattle get water, you know. So they had the whole vibe and the whole theme all laid out. And but I know those airstreams. I've owned some of them, and I know what this one would cost. And you could get one on a on eBay for probably five grand. Mm. Okay, and then you would fix it up a little bit. So say that you've got twenty grand in, into the into the little uh, airstream thing, and then you maybe spend another five grand on the little swing and the putting the lights on the oak tree in front and the little deck and the barbecue and all the stuff that makes it fun. And then you buy the property. Let's say you got you get it up at Pine Top or somewhere like that, or near the Grand Canyon, or even kind of on the outskirts of your local area. And let's say you buy the property for ten grand or whatever. You, let's say that you're in it for thirty thousand dollars. Okay. Well, I was paying for Josh to stay in this in an airstream for heaven's sakes. In an airstream, I was paying a hundred dollars a night for him to stay in this airstream. Do the math. On the ROI there, right? If we, he's got an eighty percent occupancy rate, I mean, he's bringing like right off the top of my head, he, he's bringing uh, what, what do you think, Tony? Maybe fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred yeah. a month yeah. for the bottom line, and for a thirty thousand dollar investment. I, you and 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 you on. have the asset, and you have the asset in it's terms of the airstream. Liquid, that if it doesn't work out, all you do is take your airstream and just sell it on eBay, and you'll and you'll get exactly. your money back for the airstream. And then if you lease the property, you have absolutely no liability whatsoever. You don't even, if it doesn't work out, you just break the lease or you do whatever. I mean, this is just, a, it's a no brainer business model. And for those who want to get involved with real estate and don't have a hundred thousand dollars or $250,000, maybe they've got 20. And, and even if you have 20, you can do it because there's an, there's an RV called a Shasta. You remember those, Tony, you and I are, Josh probably doesn't remember those, but you and I are at the age. Those were the, and they used to call them canned hams as well. <laughs> they were the little like uh, kind of the, oval thing and they had the silver wings on the back. Yep. Remember those? Yep. You can get those already rehabbed on eBay for like 10 or 15 grand. And what's cool about them is you can charge just as much because they still have that, uh, that iconic kind of Americana type Route 66 vibe to it. Yeah. And uh, and this these don't have bathrooms, but what Josh's setup had is a little bathhouse that they did right outside of the RV 
which they probably put together for a couple grand. I mean, it was super, super cheap, but it was cool. It, it went yeah. along with the whole uh, with the whole theme of the rest of it. So again, my point here, guys, is you can still get a 20% yield. Or what would that be? That'd be a lot more than 20%. Oh, a lot be? more than 20%. Right, we're making, Absolutely. let me do the math here. We've got uh, $1,500 a month, let's say, times 12. Uh, that's $18,000 a month on a 30, call it $35,000 investment. So that's a 50% return uh, that you're making there at an 80% occupancy rate. And uh, and it could uh, double as kind of your, your bug out area or bug out location in case uh, it hits the fan. So, I mean, it's just, it serves multiple purposes. And I think it's just a really neat opportunity that a lot of people haven't thought about and is in, uh, and is accessible to uh, the majority of the people instead of like with normal real estate, you know, you got to have a hundred to 300 grand. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, again, you always have that asset. And even if you don't rent it out, right, even if you just buy it and you park it in your driveway, right, yeah. if you ever need to bug out of your particular state, you can do that with this, right? So it provides you that freedom of mobility. I've seen people rent out their RV that is parked in their driveway on Airbnb. <laughs> like, like you just stay the night, you don't drive it, you know, but yeah. you just stay the night in their RV that's parked in their driveway and they still rent that out for like 50 bucks a night or something like that. There's yeah. a it, lot of it, ways. It's to just, it's just being creative and, and taking yeah. that. It's also taking that risk, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's a small amount of risk that we all take in doing this. And I think sometimes people, they want to have certain freedoms or they want certain liberties, but they don't want to take some of that risk to yeah. achieve them. And George, you're bringing up some very easy things to go do that we can all do, right? Uh, is there a little bit of risk involved? Yeah, absolutely. You, you could get a lemon uh, and it, it could take you more than you thought it was going to take to fix up. But, uh, you know, you got to take the risk. Mm, yeah, you well, and not just risk, but you got to take action. Yes. I think that's what it's all about. And I think one of the, the other main takeaways here is you don't want to do these things in a reactionary state. So you don't want to wait. And that's what so many people do. They wait until it hits the fan and then they scramble around, you know, freaking out when then there's state of emotion of yeah. emotion and this uh, whipped up into a frenzy. And then they're trying to figure out what to do. And you're always going to make bad decisions yeah. when you're in that mental state where if you do it and it's premeditated, then you've got an action plan. Yeah. Then if it does hit the fan, then you just execute that plan that was thought through when you were completely rational. Yeah. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. The 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 need to take action or or the fact that some people can't take action is a topic that I covered on one of my videos, you know, to share with my sub subscribers to say, you know, hey, if if you're still studying some of this and you haven't taken action, you really need to go back and do a self-assessment on why haven't you taken action? Is it because of fear? Is it because your family is, you know, saying you're going to be a failure? Is it because of past failures that you've had that you're saying, oh, geez, I don't, I don't want to fail again, right? So you really got to go back and say, you know, because all these are great ideas. But to your point, if you don't take action, never it's never going to materialize. So yeah. you got to take a look. Why haven't I take action? If it's because I'm afraid of something, why? And how do I overcome that? Yeah, you got yeah, to do that self-assessment. And that's another thing too, Tony. You and I are both fortunate to be surrounded by uh, thirty or forty incredibly, incredibly successful people this weekend. Yeah, uh, financially successful. And uh, yesterday we we went on a property tour with with Kenny McElroy's properties, and he was showing us kind of the math behind when he brought, he bought. All, some of these properties back in 2000, 2009 or 2008, 2009, right during the GFC. And I mean, the, the return he made was just absolutely staggering. But my point is that if you if, if there were if there was a common denominator for all of these successful people that were around this weekend that are in our, our mastermind group, it would be they take action. 
Yeah. They take, sometimes they don't always win. They don't always succeed, and often they fail. But they're just constantly uh, taking action. I was I was just chatting uh, with one of the uh, folks in the mastermind about cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Now I'm I'm not a crypto guy. I know next to nothing about it. Uh, but I'm trying to learn, right? right? And I'm trying to potentially jump into what you've talked about, George, in terms of asymmetrical asymmetrical plays, right? You know, uh, to be able to maybe jump in into a cryptocurrency that may be the right one for me and then see exponential upside to that cryptocurrency down the road, a year, five years down the road, right? I'm not going to invest my entire life savings into it. That, that'd be silly. But if I take a, a few thousand dollars and put it into a crypto that could potentially have a, a exponential upside, I'll take that. I'll take that asymmetric play any day of the week, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but there's risk. There's risk associated with me doing that, and I need to accept that risk. Yeah, and the way I always was before I retired is I, I never felt as though I was taking excessive risk, and it, it never seemed risky to me because every single time I took action and I took my life savings and put it on the line, I was doing so in a business that I had right, right or wrong, I had a hundred percent confidence in that I would make it work. Yeah. And so I always tell the story of, of the first business that I, I started where I had to borrow some money and uh, I put in my entire life savings and then I had to borrow 400 grand. Mm. All right. And Tony, you know, you know what my payments were on that four? I, I borrowed it from a, a guy that I had done business with. And uh, he's kind of like a mentor to me. Oh, but, good. So uh, not a loan shark. Well, the, the interest rate may have been a, a loan shark, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we were just having dinner and he's like, you know, how much money do you need? And I said, well, probably 400. And he goes, OK, well, if I'll give you 400, but you basically pay me 20 grand a month. And I'm like, OK, fine. Yeah, it took me about three seconds to say okay, but looking back in retrospect, I was like, like twenty grand a month for a four hundred thousand dollar loan? Are you kidding? And most people would have said, "Hell no, I'm not paying that." That that's you know loan shark fees or something like that. But my point is, I I although I was taking massive risk, I I was willing to do that, and I was just all about taking action first and foremost. But I had the confidence in myself, my ability, and my understanding of the business model uh, to know that that yeah, I'm, I'm going to pull this off regardless of how much I have to pay this guy per month. And sure enough, uh, that business exploded and it, it was extremely profitable. But I think that's really the moral of the story here, Tony, is whether you're trying to create financial freedom or whether you're trying to create uh, a personal freedom and liberty for yourself and your family. Uh, you've got to have a plan. You've got to educate yourself. You've got to assess the risk. But at the end of the day, you've got to get off the couch and just do something. Take action. Throw 10 things up against the wall and, and see what sticks. And, and you just can't sit there and just, um, you know, get angry on the couch at the world and like be like that old man yelling at clouds. Uh, that that's fine. And, and you yeah. want to understand the world around you. You understand what's going on with the global elite and Klaus and Trudeau and Biden and all these crazies. Uh, but um, again, the, at the end of the day, you, you want to make sure that you are setting up that game plan and you're taking that action. So uh, you're going to thrive, not just survive, but thrive yeah. in what is most likely going to be a fourth turning or a tumultuous decade of the 2020s. And, and it gets easier. Uh, the more you do it, the more you practice this, the more you take action, right? It gets easier. You know, I'm fortunate, fortunate enough to be in this collective mastermind with all you brilliant people, right? I'm fortunate to be here. And I've gotten here by, you know, taking on a certain amount of risk. But now that I'm here and I'm chatting with all you super smart people, right? I'm like the dumbest one in the room. And so now uh -huh. I'm, I'm learning from all these super smart people. And it gives me more confidence in being able to take some of those risks as well, right? Because we're talking at a higher level, right? 
And yeah. so we're batting these ideas around and it just gives me more confidence in my beliefs and in my thought process, right, to be able to take some of these risks. So for the folks out there listening, it gets easier over time, the yeah. more action you do take. Yeah, it's like a muscle, isn't it? It is. It, it's like a muscle that you go to the gym, you got to exercise it. And when you do, it, it it gets better and better and easier and easier to lift those weights. That's yeah. that's a great analogy. I think I'm going to put it in my book, George. Good, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> well, Tony, I, I've kept you a half hour, buddy. Where, when is the book out? Where can people get it? So our launch date is June 28th, and they can find it on Amazon. Okay. Uh, we're also going to be on Walmart.com, uh, Target.com. They can find us there. But for most folks, they go straight to Amazon. We'll be on Bonds and Noble as, as well. So, okay. uh, so yeah, we'll be out there. What's the name of the book again? Freedom at Risk, How to Protect Your Personal and Financial Freedoms. Okay. And what's your YouTube channel? My YouTube channel is called Dirty Boots Capital, and I do a whole bunch of different videos, everything from economics to, uh, you know, freedom vid videos to at videos on taking action, different things, different things happening in politics. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that you've shared is, you know, just get out there and start doing something different. Start talking about something, start educating yourself. And for me, put myself on YouTube, right? I need to educate myself to be able to put some of those stories out there, right? You're preaching the choir. You're preaching right? the choir. <laughs> two whiteboard videos a, a, a week for two and a half years. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's not easy. I mean, you, you, uh, God bless you. You make it look so easy, George. And I've told you that many, many, many times. But now that I'm doing it behind the scenes myself on my uh, YouTube channel, I, it, it takes time and energy to put those things together. But it's worthwhile, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. It is when you see the comments roll in and people say, you know, wow, you you really helped me understand that point, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, I I did a video on uh, Zoltan Pozar and his Bretton Woods three, cool. uh, uh, a letter that he came out on Credit Credit Suisse. Yeah, and yeah. man, that's a an eleven page very technical article. Yeah, and so I broke it down, and I don't know, I think I broke it down to like a twenty minute video, and you know, it helped me understand it better hmm. right because i had to make it understandable to a, a certain level and um in the comments i received on that you know people saying wow you really you helped me understand it that makes me feel good and gives me energy to keep going on and keep producing more and more content yeah yeah let's take an action all right tony uh you and i have to meet downstairs here in about a half hour so yeah uh we'll let you go thanks for your time and yeah. we'll see you soon excellent thank you so much for having me on george thanks buddy